Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome researcher, Leading Edge Forum, Simon Wardley. Hello, crossing the rivers by feeling the stones. Uh, first of all, I'm an imposter. I'm not going to talk about technology, I'm going to talk about strategy. Terrible subject. And once I've introduced strategy, I'm going to head south, and we're going to talk about the use of maps for strategy. And then I'm going to talk about patterns. And I'm going to use this to explain how I built uh, one of the world's first serverless environments back in 2005, and what went wrong. And then after this, we're going to do a little magical mystery tour and look at modern day serverless, assuming we've got time. So I'm going to start with strategy. Uh, personal experience for me, I, I worked at this company for Tango. So this was 2005, online photo service, millions of users, rapidly growing, very profitable. Um, but we had a problem. And the problem was the CEO. See, the CEO was an imposter, didn't know what they were doing. And I knew this because I was the CEO. <laughs> I mean, we had like a, a vision statement. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead an innovative effort of the market through our use of agile techniques and open source. This is 2003. But I pinched this from other people. So I was really worried that people would rumble that I didn't know what I was doing. So I went around recording other CEOs talking about strategy. I used to record the short words they would use, what I call business-level abstractions of a healthy strategy, or BLAS for short. So I do this every couple of years. This is 2014. These are the common BLAS, digital business, big data, disruptive, innovative, collaborative, competitive advantage. If you did it today, you'd probably put AI, IoT, bit of blockchain in there. You've got to have a bit of blockchain. And so then I created a BLAR template. Our strategy is BLAR. We will lead a BLAR effort of the market through our use of BLAR and BLAR to build a BLAR. <laughs> and then I combined the BLARs and the BLAR template and also generated 64 random gibberish strategies. Things like this. Our strategy is customer focus. We will lead a disruptive effort of the market through our use of innovative social media and big data to build a collaborative cloud-based ecosystem. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and number two, our strategy is innovative. Remember, this is all random gibberish. So I sent this around, uh, about 400 responses, three basic types. Uh, one is, this is the exact wording from our business plan. Uh, number two is, I've seen two of these used already. And three, and my favorite is, oh, you've a higher. <laughs> so a friend of mine, by the way, has put this all online. This is strategy as a service. <laughs> it's, it's just random gibberish. Uh, if, if you ever need a strategy, just type in the URL. It automatically creates you one based upon nothing. Our strategy is collaborative. We, if you don't like it, it's really simple. Just press refresh. <laughs> So about 2004, 2005, I started to think I may not be the only imposter. So I went back to first principles. Started off with Sun Tzu. Anybody know what Sun Tzu wrote? Art of War. So he talked about the importance of purpose, the importance of understanding your landscape, uh, the use of climactic patterns, so how the landscape is changing, and then into doctrine, ways of organizing yourself, and finally into to leadership and context-specific play. Then I came across John Boyd. Anybody know what John Boyd did? Uda, US Air Force pilot. So he talked about you have the game. Uh, then, of course, what you need to do is observe the environment. That's the first O, uh, landscape and climate. Then you need to orientate yourself around this. This is with doctrine. And finally, you need to decide and act. I was quite excited by this. Showed it to other people. They said, well, strategy is all about the importance of why. Well, there's two whys. There's the why of purpose, as in I want to win the game of chess. And there's the why of movement, as why do I move this piece over that piece? Fundamentally different. 
So I went back to my online photo service. We sort of had a vague purpose. It was pretty lousy. I was in charge. I asked, how do we observe the landscape? How do we map that? Because maps turn out to be very useful in strategic play. Uh, give an example of the Battle of Thermopylae. So Themistocles, ancient politician, Greek general, had a problem the Persians were invading. What he decided to do was to block off the Straits of Artemisium, force the Persians along a coastal road into Thermopylae, where a small number of troops could defend against a larger force. There are about 140,000 Persians, about 4,000 Greeks, including 300 Spartans. Right. I want you to imagine you're a member of the Athenian army. It's the eve of battle. Themistocles is standing in front of you, giving you purpose and moral imperative. And he says to you, I don't understand the landscape. I don't have, understand the environment. I have no map. But have no fear, for I have created a SWOT diagram. <laughs> <laughs> Strengths a well-trained Spartan army, a high level of motivation not to become a Persian slave. Weaknesses, the ephors might stop the uh, Spartans turning up. A truckload of Persians are turning up. Opportunities, get rid of the Persians. Get rid of the Spartans. We're Athenian. We actually hate the Spartans. Threats, the Persians. Get rid of us. And uh, the oracle says a really dodgy film might be produced a few thousand years later. <laughs> OK, so quick question. What would you use to communicate and determine strategy in battle? A visual map or a magic framework? Map. What do we use in business? Magic framework. Excellent. Right, super. So this was my problem. And so I was thinking, what is it so special about a map that makes it useful for strategy? Well, maps have certain characteristics. They're visual, they're context specific, you have the position of pieces, you have an anchor like the compass, so this is north or south of this, and you have consistency of movement. Now, the problem is people would say, we have maps. We had systems maps. But if I take something from a systems map like CRM and I move it over here, how does that change the map? It doesn't. If I shift Australia on an atlas and put it next to San Francisco, does that change the map? Yes. The problem is systems maps aren't actually maps. They're not maps. In fact, most of the things we call in maps in business aren't maps. Business process maps, my maps, none of them. It's almost as we keep using that word, and I do not think it means what we think it means. So how do you turn a not map into a map? First, you give it an anchor, customer. Then you have to add position of pieces, so I used a value chain. And then you have to have movement, and I used evolution. So you start off with the genesis of new acts, custom-built examples, products, and commodity services. And that was the first map I produced in 2005. So what? Well, once you have a map, you can start to observe climactic patterns. So these are the rules that influence the game. There's 31 of them. Things like everything evolves. If you have supply and demand competition, it moves from left to right. Second one is characteristics change. Everything starts off in this uncharted space where it's chaotic, uncertain, unpredictable, ear be dragons. Over time, it becomes industrialized, ordered, standard, stable, dull, boring. As things evolve, they also enable higher order systems to appear. Electricity enables television, radio, lighting, and all of that stuff evolves as well. This also solved a problem, because we'd gone all agile, XP in this case. In 2002, by 2003, we knew it wasn't working. Turned out that things like extreme programming, test-driven development, very good on the left-hand side, not so good on the right-hand side compared to things like Six Sigma, not so good in the middle compared to use something like Lean, so using, say, Scrum, MVP, Kanban, uh, more product owners. So what we learned was there was no one-size-fits-all. Of course, once you start to learn climactic patterns, then you get into doctrine. So these are the universally applicable principles. Things like using a map. It's a good idea, surprise, to focus on user needs, which is the top of the map. The second thing is you learn is to use appropriate methods. So you use appropriate methods at the same time. So we outsource stuff on the right. We build off the shelf, maybe use lean for the middle, build in-house agile on the left-hand side. Then you learn to think small, break things into small components, microservices, build small teams. Then you start to discover you have different attitudes. 
You have cell-based structures, the types of people you need in the left, the uncharted world. It doesn't matter whether it's marketing, finance, or engineering, are different to the types of people you need on the right, are different to the types of people you need in the middle. And you need brilliant ones of all of them. Anyway, that was sort of leading edge 2005. Uh, it's 12 years, well, yeah, 12 years later. I mean, doctrine, there's 40 different forms of doctrine. If you're interested in this stuff, GCHQ, which is our intelligence services, has very kindly open sourced this document called Boiling Frogs, which talks about doctrine and how you organize for constant change. So finally, that leads to the leadership bit. So context-specific gameplay. So if you have a map, you can anticipate change because we know climactic patterns, so we know things are going to evolve. We know they're going to enable higher order systems. That's going to give us multiple points that we could attack. And then you learn to manipulate that market. There's about 70 different forms of gameplay, from open source to fear, uncertainty, and doubt to use of constraints. So that's what we did. And we used it to build the world's first ever uh, platform as a service, a code execution environment, JavaScript front and back end with functional billing in 2005, and that was Zimke. This was Zimke in 2007. Unfortunately, back then I wasn't mapping political capital, so we had a consultancy firm come up and say, that's not the future. Uh, the three projects we were doing, 3D printing mobile phones as cameras and platform were not the future. The future was 3D TV, so we should shut it all and spend a billion on 3D TV. Didn't go so well. So then I went to work for Ubuntu. We mapped out that space, used it to attack cloud. We went from 2%, 3% the operating system market. 18 months later, we were 70% of all cloud. And then I used it for something called the Better for Less paper. We used it to help transform government. So every now and then, I see these tweets about how government has saved 425 million or whatever through the use of map. It's pretty straightforward. Anyway, these days, people now use it to write science fiction books, like The Puncher's Scroll, which is being turned into a film written by Tao Klein using mapping as well. So a quick summary. Uh, if you are an imposter CEO, don't worry. Uh, you're, you're in a, you know, it's, there's, there's lots of you, so it's OK. Um, <laughs> it, it's, there is actually a method to understanding your landscape. Um, it's important to act. Uh, the cycle, you not only understand your purpose, your landscape, it's important to act and iterate around that cycle. Um, but as you, go, as you do so, it's important to understand the landscape. It's summarized in the, the famous phrase, crossing the river by feeling the stones. So have a direction, uh, small iterative steps, and observe the landscape as you go along. And at that point, I will say thank you very much. This is all Creative Commons. Um, it's medium.com Wardley Maps. Help yourself. I've used it to build lots of businesses, save billions, and um, there we are. Thank you very much.